Well, this is the third and, and final portion of our lectures on replication. In the last two lectures, the first one we talked about how we figured out it was semi-conservative replication and what that meant. In the last one, we actually walked through all four of the major stages of replication using a, a kind of a combination of bacterial information as well as eukaryotic information, mixing those together. Uh, our purpose, again, is not to, to confuse you about that, it's to simply point out there's some shared commonalities and uh, what we know about it has these major points. These things have to happen for replication to occur. It may turn out by the time you finish college that we've renamed some of the parts, but certainly we've talked about the primary enzymes or at least some form of what needs to be there in order for it to work. Okay? All right, so we went through initiation and the complexing of that and licensing. We talked about unwinding, how helicase comes along and breaks apart those hydrogen bonds uh, to help us form replication forks and all the other processes that go there, including gyrase. We talked about putting an RNA primer down to get the process started, and then finally the elongation, which involved both a, both a leading and lagging strand. Now what we want to do now is talk about the ends of the chromosomes. It turns out that when we go through this process of replication, we, we leave some parts at the end, particularly in eukaryotic chromosomes, obviously. We're talking about not circular ones, but regular ones. We leave a gap, okay? Uh, it happens at the end of every chromosome, both ends, okay? And there's always a gap, and there's a gap because there's not, a, there's not gonna be a primer that's being put in place there, okay? And so what has to happen is that there's a, we have to somehow fill those gaps, and those gaps are very, very important. We've already talked about in an earlier lecture that, that these telomeres, are each time we go through replication, we get a little shorter, okay? and keeping those telomeres in place and keeping those ends of those chromosomes sealed up is very important, right? Uh, one of the reasons for that is because in our cells, we're constantly being invaded by new types of, of, of viruses and other things that attack and try to break down our DNA, right? So we're, well, we're being attacked. We're trying to defend ourselves by breaking up RNA and DNA. If you just have naked DNA sitting here with no telomeres, these things are just eaten apart, okay? Our own body will attack our own DNA. It's one of those odd things. So one of the ways we protect that is by having these telomeres, which also serve as caps on the end of our, of our chromosomes, okay? The enzyme that's involved in this process is known as telomerase, which again is a fairly, it's a complex of proteins and other things. Uh, it's actually a, what's known as, as, a, as a riboproteinase. It's, it's got some RNA components into it and, and all sorts of things, so it's a complex, but we'll, we'll just call it telomerase, okay? Now, just from a very, very cartooned view of what's gonna go on here, we've, guess, we've basically got these ends that ha are left unfilled, okay? We're never able to put parts down there, and we've got to fill them, okay? And simply, telomerase comes in, locates those areas, and adds the bases that are necessary to complete the process, okay? All right, now, these, these telomeres have some characteristics. In humans, there's a long repeat sequence of TTAGGG, 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 repeated hundreds of times. In fact, uh, it could be many, many hundreds of times, hundreds to, to you know, a thousand different kilobases involved here. So we can have a thousand of these bases along or whatever, okay? Now, each time we go through replication, each time those skin cells down here at the base are replicating, we lose uh, a huge chunk of these, of these telomeres, okay? Uh, we will lose sometimes 25, 30,000 bases uh, down through this, this region. So they do significantly become shorter and shorter and shorter through each replication. And again, we talked about that being the Hayfield uh, prediction, the Hayfield uh, phenomenon that as cells get older, we can tell because they're, they're, the chromosomes are getting shorter and shorter. At some point, that leads to sort of a um, this idea of senescence, that the cells just that get so short, that at least the, the chromosomes get so short, it signals the cells to, to die. All right, not only are there, we fill in the ends down here, but we also have to put caps. So there's actually some backfolding of this DNA uh, to try to make a, essentially a, a sort of a fancy cap uh, that, that comes into play and kind of molds back around like this. Uh, if I can get a, a color here that will let us see it. 
Uh, there we go, something like that probably would work. Uh, we actually get a cap that, that folds back like this at the end and makes something like that so that you get a, and you get a little cross bonding going on here so that when anything tries to attack that, uh, as far as any kind of enzymes that come along, they're not able to easily grab a hold of this, right? So these overhang caps are very important. Uh, just to take us off for a moment, uh, adipose, the, the fat, particularly the, the fat, that we, the brown fat we have around our bellies and things, uh, <coughs> the white fat of that, uh, sorry, no, brown, um, it's, it, it, in mammals, it actually can kind of take over and it's uh, the process of using P53, which is a protein, uh, produces a ROS, which is a reactive oxidative species. And what that reactive oxidative species does, this particular one, is it sends it out as a signal uh, to other parts of the body to say, hey, um, you know, we need to collect fat. And fat, the organ of fat becomes uh, an organ that says, uh, hey, I want more of this. Um, and the reason it does that, of course, is that in natural systems, when food wasn't so readily available, you had periods of time when there was a lot of food, and then you had winters and stuff where there was very little food. So when there was food, say in the fall of the year and there was lots of food, uh, fat would start to deposit, and it would tell the system, man, you better get more of this, right? Well, now, of course, we have food all year, so that's, it becomes a problem. Where this is a real issue is that in, in morbidly obese people, that particularly those that have lots of belly fat, you're sending out these signals, and those signals are affecting these, the telomerase capability. And what it does is it means that telomerase isn't working as well because of this oxidative problem. The DNA is getting shorter and shorter in each replication, so people that are morbidly obese actually age much quicker than people that are leaner. It's one of those weird things. It's because adipose is kind of taking over and causing poisoning the other parts of the system. All right. <clears throat> okay, now. This is one of those where I'm going to show you and never expect you to understand all of it, okay? I'm simply trying to show you that, that, that silly little diagram we had a moment ago of kind of a primer or telomerase coming in and sitting down and throwing a few bases on it is nowhere near the answer, okay? Uh, particularly in eukaryotic systems where we're dealing with here, it's quite complicated. We have to have little loops that form DNA structures. We have to have an RNA primers that come in. There's all these different poles. There's all this weird chromatin structure, and there's even a loop that occurs back here, okay? This D loop back and in order to, for that fork to work to make these, these uh, telomeres. So it's a very complicated model. We're just now starting to understand even the pieces, and this is just a proposed model of how those pieces fit together uh, and where they work. Now, you can imagine that most of these pieces are either pieces of RNA or pieces of uh, their proteins, and if you have a mutation that affects the POT1 or something like that back here in another piece of DNA, you may not get the right telomere formation and you get premature aging. Uh, you get all sorts of things that can occur, these traps and others, uh, where mutations that have, don't, you know, don't show up as being wrinkled wing or straight wing or whatever show up in these, in these areas can still cause major issues in the system. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show you the complexity of why I said we don't really understand this full process. We're starting to work on it, uh, and, but we do know a lot about the, the components that are there, and we're starting to guess at how those components fit together. All right? Now, let's take on message from this whole process. The whole process is that you've got an old strand and a new strand, old strand and a new strand. And what you've done is you have finally come along and you have taken this piece of DNA that we had earlier, right here, somewhere here, and we've taken that piece of DNA, it's got a little centromere, right? And now what we have done is we have, that's double-stranded DNA, we've separated that out, and we've made this thing called a sister chromatid right here. So now we've got this thing, we call it a chromosome, but in reality it's called a dyad, because of di meaning two parts, okay? And that part does not occur until we get after synthesis, right? So one of those first days when I ask you, oh, draw a draw a chromosome, everybody came out and went, well, yeah, I can do that. This chromosome looks like this. And I said, almost never looks like that. Okay, most DNA looks, you know, something like this. And only after replication do you start to look like this. Now, even after replication, it doesn't look like this, you know, it doesn't look like this nice little dense chromosome thing that you like to draw like this. And I certainly like to draw it, so I learned it. Okay. It doesn't look like that at all. That's after condensation. That's not until we're in the meiosis or mitosis. What it looks like after replication 
his long you know strands of DNA with its buddy over here all kind of next to it all lined out but it's not certainly not in this compressed form all of G2 is spent getting it in that compressed form that looks something like that okay all right but from our point we've got now got sister chromatids very important for the next few lectures all right so let's throw all this together just kind of one last throw together of what's going on okay what's going to happen gyrase relaxes the DNA how does it do it it does it by nicking the DNA itself okay and letting it spin all right helicase unwinds the DNA how does it do that it does it by breaking these hydrogen bonds in here and again all these gyrase the the topo isomerase of gyrase helicase they're complexes right but well, we're just going to give them a single name now to help us understand the process okay <clears throat> you have to have primers put down those primers are put down by primase okay all right once those primers are down and primase has come into play then dna pole can come in and DNA pole works because it only works in one direction, five to three prime here, reading three to five. That means you get one strand going one way, that's the leading strand, and then one strand that's very choppy going the other way with lots of different primers in it, and that's called the lagging strand, okay? Leading and lagging strand. Now, it doesn't have to be on top or bottom. Cells don't have top or bottom, okay? Don't get confused. Um, just look at the ways. One of the things you always have to do to answer these kind of replication problems is look at these ends and see what we're talking about. Which one's the five prime? Which one's the three prime? Is it down here? Is it up there? You need to know where those are. And once you figure those out, then you can come back and, and, and locate it, okay? All right. <laughs> DNA pole, when it hits a primer, it removes it, okay? And then, of course, we need that last little fill-in, which is done with this enzyme we call, the complex we call ligase, all right? All of that occurs. If I were to throw this drawing up on a thing, those were the pieces you'd be pointing to, all right? Okay, and then kind of the last thing to t just to remind you that most of the stuff of Kornberg's work and other things came from prokaryotic systems, but it lets us extend over into eukaryotic systems because as we learn more about it, we can just replace the ideas, but with the names of the particular enzymes and things. But the process is basically the same. Okay, uh, prokaryotes tend to have large circular plasmic DNA. You know, eukaryotes have chromosomes, these long things. We have one origin uh, usually in a prokaryotic system. In a eukaryotic system, we have thousands of origins uh, along the way. Okay, uh, the DNA that's found in prokaryotes is there's no there's no s nuclear membrane for the most part uh, of any form that we would think of, and so it's the DNA is just floating around, available to to be worked on. Inside of a, a eukaryotic, we're going to find out that the DNA is in the nucleus. And not only is it a nucleus, but it's packed down in the nucleus in various ways. And you have to un move all that packaging off the outside of it in order to, to work it. But other than that, it's still very similar, uh, with the exception of things like tel like the telomeres and telomerase and all that. There's still, you know, primase, there's got to be something to prime. You can call it primase for now. There's got to be something that's going to grow the DNA. We're calling those DNA pole. Uh, there has to be a helicase to open it up, and there has to be some kind of topoisomerase or thing we're calling gyrase to, to make the process work. Okay? All right, so what should you know? Well, obviously you need to know all these enzymes. Not, not, not the big piles of them that are put out there, but the big ones, right? Uh, you need to know the licensing factors and the things that are involved there. You need to know that you've got gyrase, you've got helicase, that you've got primase, you've got DNA polymerases, uh, you've got ligases going on, you've got telomerase. Know all of those, okay? Know what a replicon is. That's a site of replication that we have, okay? Realize that replication only occurs in single-stranded DNA, so somehow you must rule that apart, okay? Once you pull it apart, it only works in one direction, okay? Five prime toward three prime, reading three to five, writing five to three. That means that you're gonna have this bi-directional going on, but you're gonna end up with a leading strand, either the top or the bottom, and a lagging strand. Right, depending on which, which side you're on. And of course, it's semi-conservative. We've learned that from earlier. As you pull it apart, you keep an old strand, you get a new strand in place, old strand over here, new strand in place, and you end up with semi-conservative replication. All right? Now, the biggie for us, if we just back up for a second, is this, okay? We've now created sister chromatids. Right? That's come. And very important for us, this happens during S phase. It doesn't have anything to do with meiosis or mitosis directly. It needs to occur as a precursor to it. 
Certainly cell signaling, this has to happen before you even will start meiosis or mitosis, but it's not involved in it. It's not part of meiosis or mitosis, okay? It happens in a completely different phase that's out here. All right, well that completes what we want to talk about as far as replication. Uh, I think we've got enough of the bases there. Again, it's very cartoonish, I understand, uh, but this is, uh, you know, sort of entry genetics. We're just trying to get the model out there of what all the pieces have to be and then what the end product is. All right, so now we've got that, we'll go and we'll be able to take that and we're gonna move to a completely different thing and start talking a little bit about Mendel. Uh, and then we'll come back to meiosis, which involves this. So we link Mendel with meiosis, but to do that, we have to understand about replication. That's why we spend the time doing this, okay?